So, yeah, as Dave said, I'm going to be talking through a few questions about innovation, and then I will finish up with some tips that have helped me become more innovative. Okay, so, first of all, I think it's always good to start with a definition, so we're on the same page. Um, one thing I found when I was looking around about in innovation is that it means different things to different people. Um, so I found a quote that I actually think encompasses all aspects of innovation really well. Um, and that is, executing an idea which addresses a specific challenge and achieves value for the company and the customer. So a couple of key things here really is, one, that it, it needs to um, solve a problem or improve something or else it's not really innovative. And it needs to add value, which implies worth, but also the kind of newness that we think of when it comes to innovation. Um, and I think it's worth saying as well that it's different from invention, which is the creation of something that hasn't existed before. Okay, so given that innovation is such a buzzword at the moment, do we really need to jump on the bandwagon? How important is it? Um, understanding why innovation comes about can help us determine this. So as you can see, and you're probably aware of, there's several drivers that uh, lead to innovation. Um, you know, the world changes, needs and problems change, technology advances, competition, that sort of thing. So if you don't innovate, you're likely to get left behind, which means that your business could actually start to fail. However, there is a temptation to try and make innovation a goal then, in itself, and focus on it too strongly. Um, and I, I think it's important to always think about how you can improve an experience or a situation. And as front-end people, this is what we do. Um, so understanding your users' needs and what you need to achieve is the most important thing. And then innovation, for me, is what comes out of that. So, in short, I think you shouldn't make innovation your goal, you should just make it a tool to help you achieve your goals. Okay. So, we're living in a period where technology is moving faster than we can keep up. It's actually pretty overwhelming. Um, so, how can we make sense of what we need to do? Um, the temptation, I think, is to sort of think, oh wow, there's so much new tech, and look, there's VR, that's so cool, let's put it into our next project. Um, but I hope it's a fairly obvious thing to say that um, in certain situations this may not be appropriate. So if you're looking at the online shopping experience for supermarkets, um, using VR would actually be quite intrusive, I think, and too costly, and moreover too slow, and it doesn't really add a lot of value to the experience. However, augmented reality, whilst you're actually in a supermarket, could add value, because you could put up more information about a product, about special offers, or recipe ideas, etc. But if you compare that to using VR for firefighting training, then, in my opinion, this is something that's a really valuable use of VR, because it offers safe learning and assessment. Here, the costs are worth it, because it has the potential to save lives, both in the training and as a result of the training. And also, it's cheaper than trying to physically recreate um, these scenarios in the real world. So, when I'm coming to sort of work on a new piece of, a new project or something, um, I ask myself these questions, which are based on the IDEO model of innovation. So, does it add value to the user? Is, it, is there market demand? Does it actually solve a problem? Um, that's the sort of desirability factors. Then, is it technologically feasible? Can it be done? Can we do it as a company? You know, is it within our sort of skill set or remit? And, you know, obviously, does it, does it make sense to use it? And then finally, can we afford it? Can we afford to develop this? Um, but most importantly, could our customers afford to buy it? You know, things like VR, they're only really becoming affordable, uh, you know, in the last sort of months to year uh, at an individual user level as the technology becomes cheaper. So, 
What is it that makes products stand out in today's environment of constant innovation? When innovation is the expectation, how can things actually seem innovative? It becomes a kind of paradox. So I'm going to talk through a few examples of where I think um, innovation can be found. And um, I'm going to start with a company called Zipline. So Zipline, in case you're not aware of it, is a company that sends out uh, medical supplies by drone in areas of poor terrain and poor infrastructure. It has, it has the additional winning of being able to centralize resource and stock, so it reduces waste, but it minimizes the risk of people running out as well. Um, most importantly, it's quite affordable for the people that use it, because um, generally these would tend to be developing company, countries where we'd have this issue. So this is an example of innovation solving a really difficult problem, something that couldn't be solved before, um, and it's become solvable because of the change in technology. And, you know, I've got to admit, this is a different level of innovation that probably most of us work at or will ever need to work at. Um, however, that doesn't mean we can't add in valuable in innovation to what we do. So I'm going to talk through some, some ways of doing that as well. So sometimes some not very innovative products can feel very innovative. Um, not wishing to diss Airbnb, but, um, you know, it's not exactly groundbreaking stuff. You've always been able to book accommodation online, but nonetheless, it's had a massive impact on us. And, um, and that's because it's changed the way that we perceive travel and booking accommodation. And it's also um, changed the way we look at our own assets, being able to offer the same service, creating a kind of sharing economy. So the impact it's then had is bigger than the kind of, you know, the technology or the service would indicate. Um, and Airbnb, being quite an innovative company, is now looking at travel um, as a different kind of experience where um, you'll be able to actually book local people to be your personal tour guides and really get to know a location at a different level. And again, you know, you've always been able to book tour guides, but it's the fact that um, we're opening up, they're opening up, sorry, at an individual level and also making it possible for people to do uh, kind of... Um, yeah, just off their own bat, really. And um, this is actually what makes it innovative rather than the product itself. Okay. So, and again, quite related to this, I suppose, um, when something is taken for granted or there's no perceived room for innovation and then it gets improved, it can feel quite magical. So being able to get a doctor diagnosis online or even book a cab without calling, are changes to processes that have been around for a long time and that we've all really taken for granted. And most of us, got to be, admit, probably wouldn't have thought there was that much need for change. Um, but since it has been changed, we've all thought, well, particularly with the taxi thing, um, we've all thought, you know, what a great idea. This is so much easier. It takes away all these problems that we hadn't really recognized as problems because we were so used to it before. So, and again, you know, I sort of touched a bit on taxi booking there, and Uber's quite a good example of how you can change a relationship between a customer and a company. Um, you now know when your car is arriving, where it is, what the fare will be, um, what your driver and car look like, and even the car reg. And this opens up the transparency of the company so much. It just takes away all the friction points that you had before. And that changes the relationship you have with the product, or the service in this case. Um, and it does make the concept seem quite groundbreaking, even though, again, the service and the technology aren't particularly new things. You know, what Uber did really was just string a lot of sort of established tech together in a really good way. Um, and Additionally, both the driver and the customer are empowered by, by, by being able to rate each other. Okay. And then, this is the sort of thing that everyone at my work is talking about at the moment. Um, 
if you can change the relationship of a product to other products, even though, even in really incremental ways, it seems like way more innovative than it actually is. Um, and I suppose the key thing is that it lets us integrate these other products into our lives in, um, in different, newer and more useful ways. Um, and it basically means the whole experience becomes bigger than the sum of the parts. So we can see that when we're solving big problems, the technology really is key. But in a lot of cases, the innovation comes from going back to a societal or user need and an improved experience. Um, I think it's worth noting, though, that the biggest disruptors tend to tick off most of the things I've mentioned, not just one or two. And that's how they sort of have such a, make such a shift in society. So I'm going to move on to some sort of, I called them tips, maybe a bit grandiose, a, a few ideas I've had about what really helps me when I want to get into the innovative mindset. Thought they might be useful for you as well. Um, first of all, ask the right question. So this seems obvious, but I don't mean the question that you ask your user or your market or your customer or whoever, um, it's the question you ask yourselves to frame your approach. So how well is the problem defined is something you can ask yourself, or how well is the domain defined? Um, when I was improving our tutor portal, I should say, in case you don't know, Tribal, we make software for educational institutions, so I deal with the college market in the UK generally. Um, and I had to improve our tutor portal. I guess I'll show you what it looked like. It's quite blurry, sorry. Um, you get the gist though. So obviously this was first done quite a few years ago, probably over 10, judging by the design. Um, it was cutting edge at one point though. And um, yeah, I think the question I realized that was really important when I was coming to develop this product wasn't really, you know, what do teachers want to do with the product, which would be the obvious question. It's actually, what do teachers want to do with their day? And that's quite a different thing altogether. And what it really transpired was, what the teachers want to do with their day is not use our product. And, you know, that might be hard to hear, you know, if you, especially if you're really vested in something. But once I understood that, it really changed the approach and it made made all the decisions that I had to make along the way a lot easier. And that was because I knew that I had to make a product that instead of being kind of this unwieldy website that teachers have to search through and they run reports um, that actually come up in a different piece of software and it takes forever, you know, I realized that what they needed was all the data bringing to them. and. Um, the new product is a bit of a work in progress, but it looks more like this. And you know, I admit that doesn't look massively innovative. It's obviously a massive improvement, but we've all seen stuff like this. But you know, the innovation really lies in, um, as I say, serving the data to them, the product becoming smarter and dealing the, them the information they need to know at any one time so that when they actually come in, they might actually just need to look at that page and go away again. And, you know, that means that their goal of not having to use their product, our products so much, is actually um, realized. What you find then as well is that because the data is more available to them, um, they can actually intervene with issues earlier. So one of the things that is a real key thing for colleges is minimizing the number of at-risk students, and that means at risk of dropping out. And it's a massive problem if students drop out, obviously. It makes your college look bad, um, but it actually takes away some of your budget as well, so you can, it means the service that you can offer to other users becomes diminished kind of thing. Um, so early intervention is proven to, to reduce the rate of dropout, and that's a massive win. Um, so tutors can actually log in, they can see where they need to be, what their register is, any problems that need highlighting, they can just click through. And um, 
it's really turned the product around and we've got more developments to come to make it even smarter to look at patterns in student behavior to sort of um, gauge the kind of at-risk situation for them. Um, so you can see from just that one question, you've really changed the approach of what your product should be. And it, you know, it's quite hard, easy to get quite egotistical about products and go, it's got to be all these things. And sometimes you know, it's harder to think, actually, it's got to be less things, just better. Um, so it is worth sort of working out what your core questions are. Okay, so I think most of us, probably working in front end, have had some sort of circular discussion, if not many, on the UX of a particular piece of functionality. So this would be really um, an example of this. So you can see we've got a banking app here. And you've got the sort code fields. And I have had these kind of conversations, and usually I want to shoot myself by the end of them. Um, but you, get, you sort of go, well, OK, what should we do with the cursor? And someone says, well, we should move it along to save them time. And then, oh, yeah, yeah, great, brilliant. And then someone else says, yeah, but what if they make a mistake? Then they have to go back twice. Or what if they press the tab, thinking you're not going to tab? And then they're two ahead. And someone else says, yeah, but that's an edge case. And you know, it will save them time in the long run. So you know, it's got to be a win. And you just go round and round in these kind of loops. And um, it, half the time, you don't even change anything, because you can't figure out what it is you need to change. And that, to me, is because you're letting the current expectation of what technology is and does uh, frame what you're trying to achieve. And it's, I hope this is quite obvious by now, but the real answer is that nobody wants to mess around with silly little boxes. Um, they don't want to be tabbing. They want you to be doing it all behind the scenes because, you know, after all, that's what tech is for. It's meant to take away work, not add to it. Um, and it's that sort of approach that adds up to more innovative software. So this is the Lloyd's TSB app for mobile. And you can see they just have one box. And you type your numbers in. And once you type two, it puts in a little hyphen. And apologies if you can't see that. And then you type two more, and it just puts in a hyphen. And it's so unintrusive. It's absolutely brilliant. And by the end of it, you've typed your numbers. And they still look like how you expect them to look. And your brain can still process them. And you know, this is a really small little thing. But if your app has like a whole series of these kind of aha, brilliant moments, it really adds up to a great piece of innovative software. And then um, this is reflected actually, if you look around, like Lloyd's often wins awards, awards for its UX for its app. And uh, I would wholeheartedly support that because although you know, nobody loves to do their banking, I actually don't mind going on and doing it. I actually, I'm going to say I actually enjoy it, but that makes it sound a bit sad. But yes, I do, because it's just so easy and frictionless. It's brilliant. And then, um, you know, so you might not be changing the world with some kind of drone that saves people's lives, but you can still actually add a lot of value to people's day to day kind of existence. Innovation to me is often about combining ideas in the right way. I think I touched on that earlier. And it, but often that means you need to work with others to get your ideas realized. And that's OK, because you shouldn't necessarily try and do everything. So an example of this is we work quite closely at Tribal with a business intelligence company. So they make this amazing system that just allows people to harness all their data in really like visual ways. And it's really powerful. You can do. You know, you can drag and, drag and drop onto axes, you can combine things, you can drill down, you can get right to the point of the data if you want to. And you know, it's taken them years to develop this. There's absolutely no way that we at Tribal, an education company, should be even trying to replicate this. So what we do is we partner with them, and we, I suppose the win for them is that they get access then to an education market as well. And then, um, but, we have the kind of strength of software that we need for our market. So the, instead of it being just a big BI dashboard, we can like layer it through our technology and the right touch points and things. So together, 
Um, for the senior managers, they've got this really powerful key piece of kit. And they can actually see at any point in time on their mobiles, wherever, in any meeting, all the data that they need to make decisions and run the college successfully. So what I think, one of the things that we also want to do when we see new tech, I think, I don't know what you all do, but I'm guessing a lot of you do create tech. And, um, you know, when I see something new, I always get, get quite excited and I go, yay, I want to put this in. Oh, whole hog into my software and make it this amazing thing. Um, but, you know, as we've discussed before, that's not always practical or even desirable. So you do have to know what technology is out there and what's being done with it. But then think of ways that you can incorporate small pieces of it into your products. So an example here is um, we're sort of developing the ability to, for... Well, we're developing... Um, the ability to work with iBeacons in colleges. And initially, this will be so that students can sign themselves into classes. So we'll have an iBeacon in each class, or maybe just some classes to begin with, you know. Um, and uh, when they come in, they can just put their phone near it, and it automatically marks the register. Um, we've, you know, I've already talked about how much college tutors absolutely hate to do admin. And getting them to mark the register, despite how easy we've made it, is a real chore and it costs the colleges a lot of money. So here we would be adding quite a lot of value um, for something that's actually relatively cheap to implement and relatively easy for us to implement. Um, and then once it's in there, you know, you've started to change the mindset and perception of the college and the technology we're using. So once it's in there, we can then look at other ways to harness it, you know. Um, there could be information points, for example. Um, but because you've made that small incremental step, it's then easier to sort of look at how, what other uses there are for the technology. And this is sort of tangently related to what we all do, I think. But um, it's just something I was thinking about the other day, because sometimes it's not your product that's the problem. I mean guaranteed, you know, at some point you'll need to think about how to move your product forwards, but maybe this isn't the right time. Maybe it's the things that go around your product that's important. So Argos have this clever delivery model where they mark some stuff as fast track, not all of it, just some key stuff. And that, that, those things you can get at um, the same day, which is great. And you can also choose a time slot, which for me is invaluable because you know, it's difficult for me to be in for a whole day at a time. Um, and because of this, even though I never used to shop that much at Argos, I'm coming back to it more and more because I know I can just, whatever it is I need, as so long as it's something fairly basic, I can just get, right, I'll have it at seven o'clock tonight, please. And that's it, job's done. And I don't even have to worry about it anymore. So, you know, sometimes you just need to look around what you're doing and see what else it is you need to achieve with your products. Okay. And again, I don't know how many of you work in large companies. Um, I do. <laughs> and it's great, you know, there's a lot of advantage to it. But actually, to get anything done, it does seem to take eternity in a day. And, you know, sometimes it does feel like there is no real appetite for innovation. And that can be frustrating, you know, in big companies. But if you, particularly if you're in management level, I think a good, a good thing to do is to be able to listen to the people within your office and encourage them to share. And then you need to act on it, obviously, or else you'll make them really disheartened. Um, because quite often the answer to what you're trying to achieve is within. People don't just sit at a desk and type all day. They're constantly thinking. So you can harness that. And, you know, in big companies particularly, you do tend to work in silos. So um, one thing that I've done a, a bit differently at Tribal is every time I'm developing a product, at the beginning, during, and at the end, I feed back to all our stakeholders. I get them involved and hear their ideas. They have different touch points with the market than we do. You know, these might be salespeople or they might be technical services who set up the products. So they, they have insights that we don't, basically. Um, 
And we've learned a lot as the product team from just listening to them. And the other win is you give them then a feeling of ownership and involvement in your products and they, they become more engaged and it's easier for them to sell it as well. So, yeah, this is my favorite drum to bang. I mean, we're, we're relatively diverse in here, sort of. Gender, maybe. Um, maybe not different backgrounds and things like that. But, um, yeah, I don't think it's any secret that a more diverse team will make better software, make better products, um, be more innovative. And there are studies to prove this as well. Um, because basically, it is human nature to sit and think within your own sphere. And we all do that. And we, we think, oh, yeah, this sorts out what I need. I'm all right, Jack, you know. And you don't necessarily think about what other people need. Um, so I do recognize that, you know, you can't just go, oh, yes, let's be more diverse. And we'll do that tomorrow. You know, it's something you have to start putting in place. And it has to happen over time. So in the meantime, I do think it's quite important that you get out of the office and you hear other voices um, and you allow other people's thoughts and opinions to be your catalyst for innovation. Okay, so do stuff and get involved. So you're all at Front End North. That's a pretty good start. Obviously, going to conferences is a really good way to get ideas and to meet people. Um, Sheffield actually has, I think, the most tech meetups per head than anywhere in the country, so yay. Um, and, you know, there's some amazing groups like Agile Sheffield, Code Up, Product Tank, who are really, like, talking about how you can change the way you work. And there's also all the ones for all the technologies that you might be using. And just getting out of your day-to-day -day routine will actually... It does actually help you get into a different mindset, into one of innovation and ideas. And that's partly because you're meeting new people and quite often they're quite dynamic and creative because they're taking the trouble to come out of a cold evening, not just go home and play whatever it is that people play these days on the computer. <laughs> you can tell I'm not into computer games. Um, you know, and while you're there, you're learning new information and new skills, and you're hearing different viewpoints as well. So one of the things, a shameless plug that I do is the Code First Girls, where I teach um, girls at the university to code, to do front-end coding. And um, incidentally, we need a new assistant instructor this term. So if anyone was interested, come and speak to me afterwards. Sorry, Kim, <laughs> shameless plug there. But um, yeah, it's a really worthwhile thing to do. I would recommend it. But the other thing is that it's really given me a massive insight to what the barriers of technology are for people and all the assumptions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis don't really hold true. So we teach girls that don't do tech uh, degrees. So, you know, sometimes it is quite mind-blowing to, to see the problems they're having. Um, and it's a really good thing to be party to because it really improves how you think about technology. And um, I think... Another thing that's really good to mention is the start of weekend. I've done this and I learned so much more in one weekend than I had done in months, really, that I could have done on my own. And, you know, that is just a hotbed of innovation. So um, I couldn't recommend it more, really, because you'll learn so much. So I am running out of time. But I decided this quote actually sums up what I've been trying to say better than I ever could. Um, I will read it because I'm not sure how clear it is, but... Be different, be unique, be innovative, but only do this if you're actually solving a problem. You don't have to be loud to be different, um, but sometimes the most impactful things are the most quiet and subtle. And that's someone, Sarah Doody. So if you've not heard of her and you don't follow her, I do recommend it. She's an expert in all things UX, but she also talks about um, innovation and research and all sorts of things quite a lot. The final word is that I think the biggest innovators are the most passionate people. So it's a passion for creativity, for technology and problem solving and for enhancing people's lives that brings out the best in innovation. Thank you.